Yo, and welcome to the 117th episode of Lake of Rage Pokemon Trading Card Game Podcast. I'm your host, as always, Kevin Clementi, aka Mellow underscore Magikarp. I'm joined today by a very special temporary guest host. Joining us for uh, many times by now, we have the one and only Henry Brand. Henry, how you doing today? Doing great. I feel like I'm at home now. This is like the, <laughs> well, third time with you, but fourth time overall, I think. I think we need to keep having you on. I think that's the only conclusion to this. I won't, I won't say no. It's fun. <laughs> I don't want to say a big thank you to Henry, too. It is, what, one thirty in the morning for you right now? Uh, it's 12.30, actually. 12:30. Okay, so it's not that late. It's too late for me. I'd be in bed yeah. by now. So thank you to Henry for joining us at what can only be described as an hour of the day. <laughs> <laughs> Very special episode for you all today. Uh, we're going to give a quick podcast update in a second. And then we're going to talk about the prizing updates. A lot more money being thrown at regionals, ICs, and worlds. We're going to talk about the IC dates that were announced. I'm pretty sure this has to be by far the earliest that's ever happened, right, Henry? Yeah, like without a doubt. Like there were definitely a couple of years I wasn't like you know finger to the pulse, mm-hmm. but this is, uh, yeah, it seems pretty quick. And then we're going to talk a little bit about Obsidian Flames, which was the original plan. When I DM'd Henry, I was like, hey, can we talk about Obsidian Flames? He was like, yeah, of course, I got a ton. And then uh, all this news drop, <laughs> which is going to take a ton of the time. This is very, very big news. It's really hard to describe. And for anyone listening to, we'll get to this too, but anyone listening who's like, oh, I don't know if I'm good enough for that. It's you will have that one tournament, even if you've never day two'd before, and suddenly you have an extra thousand dollars in your pocket. And you're like, Whoa, that's a lot! It's not bad, yeah, it's not bad at all. But uh, a quick podcast update so we did miss last week's episode. This is going to happen uh, fairly frequently moving forward because I am the host and I record on the weekends, and I got league cups now because I am trying to be competitive. I'm skipping a ton of them. I skipped two this weekend, I'm skipping one next week. I'm not that much of a grinder, but we're going to miss probably one to two episodes a month moving forward because I will be going to league cups instead to try and play Pokemon and like regional weekends, like the weekend of Sacramento. I ain't recording nothing. Y'all are on your own, you know. Good, good luck on that one. So if you don't know this, follow us on Lake of Rage Pod on Twitter or X or whatever you want to call it. And you will get these updates of when we're going to skip an episode here and there. Or just check your podcasting platform and realize, oh, there's nothing there. That's as intended. So like I said, probably two to three episodes a month instead of the usual four. Anyway, we have some really big news. We alluded to it a little earlier. The updated prizing for the Pokemon, let's start with the regional championships. So I'm not going to give every single dollar amount. If you want, go find Christopher Shemansky on Twitter. See Shemansky. Uh, 10 out of 10 follow. Definitely someone you want for all the updates and things. Yeah, it's, there's like a list of people that you should follow on Twitter, and he is definitely on there. So is Henry. Be sure to follow at Ben Rebrand. Thank you um no chris posts some cool stuff but even like un pokemon related sometimes he posts some really interesting stuff so i, I highly recommend that um but i actually want to i want to start this the prizing thing off with a little bit of like how i um got the news because oh yeah i like saw it but i kind of had a feeling something was cooking for a while mm-hmm. you could have a look like this isn't like this isn't like secret info or like sources or something this is just like looking kind of holistically at what pokemon is doing and why And you could kind of see it leading up to this. Like, they're pushing gameplay. Like, they've just made the Path to the Peak animated show. Like, they're clearly pushing people playing rather than collecting. As an aside, have you watched it? I have, yeah. Okay, it's so good. (laughs) I Like, they did such a good job. Anyway. Yeah, it's it's good. Um, And so, like, everything they're pushing is going towards playing. You can also tell that with... There's all of these things are just tiny little, like, signifiers. Because, let's say, like, the world's invite being a bit more exclusive now. Well, in order for them to do that, they then have to put more focus onto the other tournaments as a result. So, mm-hmm. like, every other tournament is now getting more, like, views or, like, more focus, like, the regionals, like, they're making storylines. And so, in order to do that, like, well, they need to have more incentive to do it. And, and so, something was coming. And then they didn't announce, when they announced the season dates, they didn't announce the prize amounts. And as soon as they didn't put the prize money, I was like, yeah, that's, this thing's <laughs> hiking for sure um did you expect this level of hiking though uh no i don't think so and i don't think in the way that they did it i think i kind of expected 10 like i kind of expected a double but i think there's the removal of the kickers for the prize money is something really specific that we need to talk about but also just like the the one grand for 32 i didn't expect it to be like so like doubled everywhere right i expected it to be like doubled at the top and then Mm -hmm. like not as like weighted 
but um it's crazy it's it's insane like it is there is so much money in the game now it is ridiculous like i don't know i don't even know like how to explain it but you go top 32 at an australian regionals now and like we'll talk about it as, as a worldwide thing and then get specifically into how it affects my small country but it's like now in the u.s right like because i i came top 32 i went to two u.s regionals top 32 and, and i won one of them and so my prize money would have gone from like, like well doubled obviously but mm-hmm. the top 32 is like 250 and that doesn't feel like a ton like it's that is you know, it's kind of like well the way it was yeah. described to me after my first like day two and stuff like that was by a friend Liam Williams, right? He was like, mm-hmm. congratulations, you're on the hamster wheel where you make just enough money to pay for the next regional to go to to make just enough money. And that's what top 32 felt like. It was like, oh, I've got enough to buy a plane ticket <laughs> to go to California now. Sweet. Yeah, no, it's it's sweet. Um, How did like specifically as well? For me, like, I want to be going to more US regionals, and I actually will be, but, like, in the past, it's just not, like, ever financially worth it. Like, you don't even break even, right, unless you win. Mm-hmm. Like, or something like that. But now, you can top 32, and you can probably mostly get most, like, not all of it, but if you go to three regionals in your trip, and you top 32, three of them, well, then you get your money back. So, like, it's actually feasible. You came to the US last year for some regionals, and you proved, oh, these things are free. And then we saw Brent Tonneson tweet out that he's going to be traveling to like a lot of U.S. regionals. Are you going to be joining? I mean, may not literally joining the same ones, but are you going to be joining that of like, oh, well, it may as well be worth it to fly out here and then uh, steal yeah, some of our money. 100%. Um, yeah, I mean, like, like I'm doing this professionally now, like and actually, funnily enough, I like I'd been doing it for like a little bit, but I, I told like I actually told my mom specifically that I was like. You, you know obviously knows what i do and like i've been doing this for a bit but it was always concurrent with school and i mm-hmm. was just like i go back from japan and like pretty much straight away i was just like hey just letting you know like this is gonna be my job for a bit and then it was like an interesting conversation and then the <laughs> next day the next day all this massive prize money increase and i just like call her up and i was just like remember i told you like <laughs> pokemon's pokemon's on the up <laughs> um that's, and anyway so it was a, a nice little like surprise but that's perfect timing right there you're just like this is my job and you're like this is my job <laughs> <laughs> yeah i mean like and and it's really good because like top 32 out of like a thousand people should probably get more than 250 bucks when each person mm-hmm. is paying like 50 bucks like oh, sorry 100 bucks yeah <laughs> it's, like, uh... it's like it that doesn't make sense where the money's going to and so this is this is like a big deal and it also beyond just like engagement and everything what it does for like hyper modernizing like, maybe that's not the right word but elevating like the difficulty and skill of the game is like not to be underestimated because if i'm saying like not doesn't not necessarily but because of the announcement but if i'm saying it's more feasible for me to do this full time mm-hmm. i'm not the only one saying that true at all right like now it's gone from maybe like two dozen people in the world who could do it full time maybe even less because it, you have to do coaching to maybe now like potentially between like 50 to 100 if not more right but, depending on like how you do it yeah it's one of those like unspoken things in the trading card game where it's like if someone's a professional it's not the prize money it's not even youtube it's almost always coaching i think andrew mahone is the exception to that rule where he does in fact make enough money off of youtube and such and probably ldf yeah. too but like in general the azuls of the world and whatnot like coaching does most of their work and that may not be true anymore like this, no, this could yeah. realistically be the thing now that actually gets people because like okay this is a real quick run under the number so you mentioned a little bit ten thousand for first place at a regional that's a very large sum of money that is something where yeah depending where you live your means and stuff like that that is a very large chunk of an annual income to live fairly comfortably with right there and granted winning a regional is hard but (laughs) that's it's not is you should get reward for that right essentially like you said right and then it goes down anywhere in top eight goes seven thousand five thousand three thousand from two top four and top eight two thousand for top 16 thousand for top 32 those are, like I said, very large sums of money that if you're able to perform and the top players should be expected to perform at a top 32. I think it's like it's interesting. So you're coming from a different perspective than I am. You're like top 32. No problem. I'm someone who's like, OK, top 32 is like a reasonable goal for me. 
Mm. But I think it's something that any listener out there should realize it is achievable for literally anyone in the tournament to get a top 32, assuming you've practiced, you have a good deck, etc. Right. Like that's not an unrealistic goal for anyone to get to and anyone to reach. And it happens all the time. You have that person at locals who randomly top 16 to regional, right? It's it never fails. Like that could be you like this will impact you, assuming you put the time and the effort into and suddenly, you know, your hobby that is very expensive at times becomes very manageable because you top 16 one regional and like, hey, that paid for three to four trips this year. <laughs> like that is really nice. It's really good. And I think like you said it's manageable, but I, it will become more difficult as a result of this because people will put the time and the effort in where previously they might not have been motivated. You know what I mean? Like, yeah, now the difference between like the difference between 33rd and 32nd is way more noticeable now um than it was before like 250 bucks if you missed out you'd be like ah whatever but now it's like a grand like now you're like sheesh and 18 more packs (laughs) oh there you go that's the whole (laughs) that's the whole appeal yeah that is a huge yeah so anyone 33rd place and below gets zero dollars and 32 to 64 still gets the 18 packs the half of booster box so that is uh they did lower the CP kickers as well, the championship point kickers. And that was a while ago they did that. But that's also relevant, like there are more championship points available too, technically in the game. So there's a lot more going on at regional championships. They really, like you said, they're clearly trying to make these a bigger thing. Now, will they give venues to support it? It's a different question. <laughs> but uh mm. We'll see. Yeah, uh, Pittsburgh sold out almost immediately. Peoria sold out. I'm pretty sure almost immediately. Sacramento. Yeah, I missed out on. I missed out on Peoria. Oh, are you gonna go? Yeah. Well, I was half half, and I like was in Japan. And I didn't wake up in time to register. <laughs> Am I gonna see you in uh, Sacramento? Yeah, you know it. Okay, sweet. Uh, Sacramento. At the time the podcast goes up, will be a couple days, so it'll be this Wednesday. So we'll see if that one lasts. Usually, West Coast regionals are a little more chill. It was like, I've never missed a registration, and most of the reason why is okay. I go to the West Coast. <laughs> so I'm really hoping that they are uh, ready for potentially record-setting numbers, right? Yeah, hopefully. So you mentioned one other thing before we move on to the ICs. There is no mm. more kicker, which helps a lot for juniors and seniors. Very massive for them. Like, they get this yeah. large amount of money, period. They earn a little less, but it's 25 Hundred for first, two thousand for second. Like these are very large sums of money, just period for kids. Yeah, that's a lot. But also, Pittsburgh is going to be uh, fourteen hundred people. How big is Perth Regional going to be? Well, that's a really good question. <laughs> I want to tell you, I've run, I've won three regionals in my time. Uh, one was the one in uh, America, Milwaukee, where twelve hundred people, something like that. Mm-hmm. The other two were both Perth regionals twice. Now, uh, <laughs> some of my friends say that I cannot win a regional with three-digit attendance. <laughs> because... <laughs> that is true, Perth, that is true. <laughs> it's true, I haven't. The Perth one had, like, one of them had, like, 97, I think, and then the other one had, like, 50, because the, the 50 one was just be- because COVID was about to happen. Like, it had just happened, and then, like, everything was going into lockdown, but, like, everyone went and played Pokemon. Yeah. Um, and then, yeah, and then then locked down, but I would say we'll probably get about maybe 150 to 200 for Perth this year, just because of where it is. So anyone who's not like acquainted with the Australia as a country, it's like this, right? This, everyone lives here on this side. Everyone lives East coast, like 90% of the population. And then a tiny bit live in this like small city on the other side, Perth. And so Perth is over here and it's really nice, but it's like expensive and a long way to get to and not many people live there so Mm -hmm. but now if you go to perth all the perth regionals in the past were 1500 for first place now they're 10 grand 10 10, so it's insane you you used to always lose money going to perth regional is it expensive for you to get to just going across the Um, country it's like i'm trying to do the conversion rate to us dollars it's probably like 350 return oh that's 400 that's not bad it's pretty expensive i guess for like australian flights yeah yeah it depends on like as, as a west coaster where we end up with a similar financial dynamic as you all where everywhere mm. on the east coast is very cheap to get to because it's all there 
uh then yeah. uh, that's a pretty cheap flight to me that's probably what i'm gonna pay to get to california but uh let me, let me see Wait, melbourne to perth I'll do, I'll do a quick check flights um yeah that was about right that was about right like okay. if you get the really cheap ones it's about that okay so to me not bad to a lot of our listeners are like that is that is way out of my price range for a regional <laughs> and that's one of the what three in the country that you get i guess that's a future yeah future we get three yeah we get three who knows if we get like a special event or something but i don't know i think that's just such an unbelievable amount of money to be getting for a, like a small tournament the fact that there's now no kickers especially that top is, 32 as well right like that's a top yeah. third of the tournament if there's 150 people which would be a record setting number yeah yeah like you just get so much money for going to these tournaments and top eight how much does top eight get like what four top eight would be three thousand three thousand yeah see i mean that's ridiculous so are you that's saying crazy. are you expecting people to come to perth from outside of the country and like outside of think, the region, I guess would be a. Yeah, I think this this ties in with like another thing to talk about, but we, we can segue into it. But now there's no like I see. Yeah. So no one's going to come for that. So people might want a reason to come to Australia to play Pokemon. And now a regionals is pretty good because it's the same as an IC in terms of money. It's actually slightly, yeah, it's like yeah, about the same, like slightly better than it used to be. Um, and so like people will definitely come, I think, and like for holidays and all of that. Um. But I was I was actually originally before this announcement, I was planning to skip one of the Australian ones mm -hmm. um, so that I could do two European ones. Let's go uh, instead. But now I don't know because <laughs> it seems like throwing the bag away, you know, it's <laughs> a lot of money you're leaving on the table to go five, four. Yeah, yeah, I know. <laughs> but we'll uh, we'll see how that one goes. Um, but I guess we should probably segue into ICs. Yeah, let's go ahead and jump into ICs super quick. So there are three, as we alluded to, IC locations. Believe it or not, this is not a planned having Henry on after this announcement. <laughs> this is just a uh, perfect timing for some great input on this decision. I'm, uh, I'm going to put it that way. I'm going to leave it as positive as possible. <laughs> So we have LAIC November 17th through 19th in Brazil, Sao Paulo, uh, EUIC April 5th through 7th in London, which I'm excited about as a personal note. My birthday is the 8th and that's during our spring break. So I've gotten Ooh. the blessing to potentially go. We'll see if I want to. But uh, hey, maybe, you know, get a top 32 in Sacramento and I got the money for a plane ticket. There you go. NAIC. This is the actual like I am so hyped for this oh. one. June Same. 7th through 9th which is like a day, right? It's way earlier than normal in New Orleans, Louisiana. Have you ever been to New Orleans, Henry? I have not. I've not been to New Orleans. Me neither. And I've heard nothing but the best things. My wife did her honeymoon or not honeymoon. What's it called? A uh, bachelorette party in New Orleans. And she was like, it was amazing. We have to go back. And now apparently we're going back. Other best Sick. part. Columbus, I spent about $800 on my flight to Columbus, Ohio last year, which is disgusting. Yeah. You know, that's why I said Perth is pretty cheap, right? That was my flight to yeah. Columbus. I can get a whole row of seats for me, my wife, and the baby for less than it cost me alone to go to Ohio, which is that's a so massive dub, a place I actually want to go to, and it is significantly cheaper. Yeah, it's it's cool. I mean, it's like way cheaper because we also caught that domestic flight like from as Australians, like trying to get there. So it's way more expensive. But okay. also it's nice. Like it seems like a place with a bit more culture. And I like doing non Pokemon stuff while I'm at Pokemon events. So that sounds good. There is only so much culture in the United States, but New Orleans would be one of those places where there is a lot to absorb from. Yeah. Except only what I've heard, because I haven't been able to do it, but there is a lot if you're willing to go look out for the things that are going on there. Or yeah. the Twitter discourse. There's a lot of alcohol as well, if that's what you're into. So do you have any other thoughts on these three before we talk about the elephant in the room? Um, so we actually get Sao Paulo dates, which is crazy, which is really good. Um, that's kind coming of up. To be yeah, dude, I got a book. I got to get on that. Um, Really on that, but there's like I think that's good. I like London. London would be cool. It's like the week after my birthday, so it should be kind of fun. Um, Wait, we have almost the same birthday. When's your birthday? First of April. Hey, let's go. We're only a week apart. Anyway, <laughs> yeah. So yeah, like I think it's cool. Um, good dates. Interesting. They're very early compared to when they usually were. Um, 
Must be either set related or like June. Yeah, maybe June's set related. I don't know what the June one's about because it's about a month earlier than it usually is, like three weeks. So right, because normally there's like the there's like a Wisconsin one. You know, if, I don't know if you've ever been yeah. there before. Yeah, there's a Wisconsin one in June, and that's yeah. like the last one before we get the NAIC set, right? If I'm remembering correctly, yeah. I could be incorrect, but yeah. Yeah, yeah. So it's like it is. It's a weird date for as far as set releases go, but maybe that means something's going to happen at Worlds too. We don't actually know if there's like. You know, there's going to be a larger set than they want it exclusively for Worlds, unlike this past year where Worlds mm-hmm. format was the exact same. I don't know. Yeah, I'm not too sure, but hopefully it's something cool. So, um, yeah, I, I like them all. I think I like the new place for NASA. Um, some fun, some different. It's nice to move the cities around as well. Mm-hmm. Um, and I actually, I saw a lot of. I didn't understand this. I saw a lot of London hate on Twitter. <laughs> I recently, saw but... one of. One thread that might be the same one you're talking about, which was specifically about the food and the everything about London. Yeah, I mean the food. If you go, if you know where to look, the food's fine. The yeah, food's, like food's good anywhere. Like you can find good food anywhere. I went to a really good burger place and taco place in London, but I saw something saying there's nothing to do in London and it's like a boring like city. And I was like, are you kidding me? That one's untrue. There's like, no way that's true. <laughs> Oh, it is insane. No, I, I saw it there. Like, it's a boring place. There's like nothing to do for tourists. It's like, go to a museum, man. There's there's a lot. And if you're like, really, yeah. you can take, oh God, I forget what the train's called, but there's literally a train that will take you to France. Like, it is cheap. It is fast. Eurostar. There you go. There's the Eurostar. Like, if you're like, oh, there's yeah. nothing to do, take, you know, two days, go there, <laughs> spend a day in France, and then come back to play Pokemon. Like, yeah. It was it was incredibly cheap. I like it's, it's been years since I've done it, but I remember it was really fast. It was really easy, and it was incredibly affordable for the fact that you're yeah. like literally going underwater to a different country. I feel like that should be more expensive. No, it was good. I, I like London. I think it's cool. I think it's a nice vibe of a city as well, even though people may disagree. But anyway, it's nice to nice to go there again. So I think it'll be good. No, I'm with you. There's there's a lot in London or around London that you can definitely do, and if you've done it all, then you've just gone too many times like there's like that <laughs> that might be there for like 10 years like right yeah. like that might be true like if you've lived there for 10 years you're out of stuff <laughs> sorry <laughs> so the elephant in the room is ocic has been canceled now most of the discourse that we see because content creators are mostly north american with a handful of europeans and a lot of the bigger names on twitter are also north americans and europeans is wow this sucks Henry, do you have a more nuanced view <laughs> beyond wow this sucks? Yeah, I do. I think um I just got a I got a lot I got a whole list. I got a whole list. First off, <laughs> um I did it again. I'm like I'm like the guy with the you know that meme with from all it's always sunny with like the pin board and like I do exactly, yeah, you know, yes. Like, yeah. Yeah, yeah. That's like that's like me. So as soon as they announced um they announced the And, you know, you hear nonsense rumors, like, all the time from, like, all these people, you know, like, Worlds is in Korea, Worlds is in Hawaii, Worlds is in France, like, you know, all stuff like that. Like, you never know. But I saw that they changed the invites, right? So (laughs) they changed 600 CP NA, 500 CP Europe, 300 CP Oceania. And that one actually made it easier to qualify than 250 usually. Mm -hmm. Because 50 more, but the kickers are, like, way easier and, like everything like that and yeah. so i was like if we have the ic this is just objectively easier and it doesn't align with what they're doing so pokemon may not do what we want them to do all the time but they always do something for a reason yeah like they're doing things for a reason they're not dumb like <laughs> they just might not have had the same like values that we do but they're definitely like scheming at all points so i feel like that they're they, not um, dumb needs to be restated they are a very successful company like you said yeah. they may not care about the players at various times but uh, they know what they're doing. They they sure do. Um, and so as soon as I saw that, I had a feeling that we weren't getting the IC because it just didn't make sense. It didn't make sense for us to have like an easier invite. Mm-hmm. So, um, yeah, and so we didn't get it. Um, it sucks in a while, in a couple of ways. So let's go with like some milestones that now can never be achieved. Mm-hmm. So um, an Oceania player can now never win Oceania's <laughs> IC. I mean, that's on y'all. You had your chance. <laughs> yeah that one's on me that one's on me um so now we can't win that uh, i personally now can never go to all four ic's in one season i never did it um, oh that's true so now i can't um 
I can do all three now, but I can't do all four. And the other thing, which which actually is more like less of a statistic and more just like kind of a vibe thing, I really liked everyone coming from around the world to where I live mm -hmm. specifically. You know, nowhere close to anywhere else on the planet, like a really like isolated place to come play Pokemon. And I get to like, they get to be in my city, and I get to be at home. But more so, it's just, like nice to see everyone come to a place that they probably wouldn't have been otherwise. Um, I mean, I even feel this like. When I get home from trips nowadays, like I feel like I'm in the middle of nowhere. Like I feel like I'm so far removed from the rest of the world. Yeah. Because like how long it takes and how different the vibe is and stuff. So and, and everyone always really liked Melbourne. Um so that kind of sucks. But I think people will do it for regionals now, but it doesn't have the same kind of big deal. That and was it sucks. I was one that I was always jealous of for I've never gone to OCIC. I was never gonna go. It's a very awkward time for me to take a vacation as a teacher. Mm -hmm. But just seeing the pictures and seeing the stuff and it's like i have to make my way out there and i will one day and i'll hit you up don't worry but yeah. it's definitely something that i think a lot of people they wanted that vacation they wanted to be like oh i'm going to australia for pokemon and i may as well stay a week right and yeah. now it's like okay i have to separately plan a vacation when i'm already traveling around the world which for some people like myself that's fine it's whatever like that's i don't travel that much but for people who travel all the time that might be a little much so it does suck that people are going to miss out on what every time looks like such an amazing experience it's pretty cool yeah it's it's pretty cool we've had like the venue the event itself has had some organizational difficulties over the years mm -hmm. um just due to like a lot of infrastructure things in australia and like how we only really have we don't have cheap convention centers mm -hmm. they don't exist because we have small cities and like they're pretty high demand and they're expensive and as a result you like get some issues with budgeting and that's probably a part of a reason why it ended up getting canceled, especially mm -hmm. now that Australia is just Australia and not Asia Pacific, but yeah. well, we got New Zealand, but um, yeah. Uh, and so like, it, it does make sense. I think it's a bit tough. I would like to see something replace it, mm -hmm. but I feel like we haven't actually seen every detail of the season yet. So how many regionals or SP, regional slash SPEs do you usually get for your region? So we always only get three regionals, but mm -hmm. in the past, one year we got a special event in Melbourne and New Zealand. We got that twice, I think. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, we did. We got that two years. We got a special in Melbourne and a special in New Zealand um, for two years in a row. But then the last two years, we haven't got those. Okay. Um, so now like, we might get another allocated event, I would imagine, because uh, it's a bit weird to not have like the IC, even though it makes it like a little bit like harder like justifiably harder and this is why i was traveling more in the first place it sucks to only play three events a year yes like, plus an ic but it just sucks it's like none like you just want to play pokemon and also even if you go to the ic's how can you be expected to compete with people who play 12 events a year when you only play three that's one of the secrets of top players is the best way to improve at the game is to play the game yeah, well, the best way to play improve at tournaments is to play tournaments because it's a different skill. Mm -hmm. If you sat like someone down in like a stress free, like untimed, like you know, like match, then you'd probably do a whole lot better than if you were just thrown into a tournament in like round eleven and you have to play like again. Yeah, so so I totally get that where you're just like I just need to play more Pokemon to be able to I don't know win worlds or whatever your goal is. I don't know what your goal is even more. You want a second worlds win? Are you kidding? Of course. <laughs> Gotta make sure. You never know. You could just be like, oh, I'm chilling. I've done it. I've achieved everything. My deck's been printed. We're good to go. <laughs> no way, man. No, because like also, I don't know. This is completely un like separate topic. But for me, like I, I won so long ago now and like I was so young. You know what I mean? Like I know I was like, I was like, what, 19 or 20? That's five so years ago, bad, wasn't yeah. it? But, yeah, it was five years ago. Like I feel like a completely different person. Yeah. So I feel like I feel like old me won it. But like if I want to like go forward, I can't just keep coasting on that. You know what I mean? I gotta do it again. I actually want to win an IC because then I would be the second person to win every type of event. Who was the first? Okay. He beat me to it. LAIC 2019. So you're saying um, Robin's a better player. Is that a yes. canon? Okay. That's fair. <laughs> <laughs> I feel like people so, forget how good Robin is because he's been like, he hasn't even been casual this season. His last season's like performances were very good. But like, Oh, that's the limitless guy. <laughs> it's like, yeah oh no yeah that's a world champion IC champion like it's a pretty good player yeah he just doesn't play that much anymore but he doesn't i guess doesn't care as much but 
it shouldn't be it shouldn't be forgotten yeah are you expecting with this announcement like so normally we would see a fair amount of the tpc regions malaysia singapore japan etc come down Mm -hmm. to ocic and they do that to other ics too but obviously that one is a you know same ish time zone cheap flight etc are you expecting them to start to come to more regionals and stuff like that especially with the increased prize pool like is that something you're thinking is going to happen i see you nodding your head i think so yeah i think so i think the age of points being the reason people play tournaments is starting to go Mm -hmm. i think that's good i I think that's really good like i said they're trying to put focus on the events themselves and now they've done it because like are you kidding if there was an event for 10k in asia that i could go to like and didn't give me any points at all hell yeah i'd be there in a heartbeat <laughs> they don't actually let me play in asia but they don't let anyone but like native people play otherwise i'd be there in a heartbeat are you kidding yeah i'll go to singapore and play a 10k tournament absolutely but um so yeah i'd expect a lot i'd expect like them to start coming which i think is that's like another like quick aside removing the like points are the only thing to play for is just generally so nice because there was so long with that discourse of like 600 championship points for the u.s is so many how am i ever going to achieve it and people were like why don't you just try to win the tournament and do your best and improve and etc and the extra money really makes that even more feasible like okay my goal is to break even on going to regionals this year right like that is that means you're doing well that means you're improving like that is tangible and also It's technically very achievable with those giant it prize is. payouts. Yeah, it's it's absolutely absolutely achievable, and people can actually focus on the tournament they're going to rather than like worlds as some some goal, which is good because like worlds never should have been the point. Mm-hmm. But you know, it's like easy to like have it like end goal and like a I don't know. But now that there's actually money, like you could come out of a season and not qualify for worlds, but be like, dude, I made five k playing Pokemon this year. How sick is that? You know that's not, I mean? that like, sounds great to me. <laughs> that's pretty cool. Like, if I when I was when I went to first regional, I was like, dude, I just made fifteen hundred bucks. Like, <laughs> and now you make like, top four, and you're like, you're way above that right now. Yeah. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. So I think it's sick. I think the focus being taken off worlds is pretty cool. Um, and then hopefully, like the rest of the circuit. Like I said, they know what they're doing, and this is exactly what Pokemon wanted to do, and they succeeded. Now, all the puzzle pieces are aligning the way that TPCI wanted them to. That is, yeah, yeah you, you've made that very clear, and I think that's important to reiterate. Whether you like yeah. it or not, they know what they're doing, and they're doing it. It's hard not I'm to sure like this one. The yeah, mo- this is pretty cool. We're just, we're just pawns. We're just the puppets. <laughs> just play Pokemon. Yeah, just- hashtag play Pokemon. <laughs> <laughs> Any other thoughts before we jump to Obsidian Flames? I think that pretty much sums it up. Um, I'm actually one thing to keep an eye on is I'm interested to see how the online format, so online events and the information age changes with the advent of the cash prize increase, because people might have more of an incentive to keep their ideas to themselves. So that's an interesting. Do you believe that there are, and this might even jump to the Obsidian Flame stuff? Do you believe that there are still plenty of ideas that can be had? Yeah, hundred percent. Okay, so like, you- I mean, I'm, I think so for sure. I think one of the big things is like, I mean, I had a deck last format, which like, I'm not gonna, it didn't end up being like super something that I could be comfortable playing to an event. Mm-hmm. Um, but like, it's still something I haven't seen anyone else build. And like, at the end, like it was a bit sketchy. But even if it's a sketchy deck, like, people would post about it or like, not would, but like, it's hard to imagine like, it didn't get found, I guess. So like, and or it's actually it's more so that if someone found it, surely they would have played it at, online at some point, or Jake Earhart would have posted about it. <laughs> Gotta get like those that. Twitter you know likes. I mean? Yeah, like, you know what I mean, like, um, yeah, it's a. Uh, so it definitely exists. Like there, there just are like things that don't always get spotted, or they're not quite good enough to make it. But like that doesn't mean that there aren't combinations that like can be. Mm-hmm. Um, and especially when they're really convoluted, and people like put too much. It's a couple things. Um, there is a lot to be said for playing just an inherently strong meta deck, right? Like, it'll do you well in the long term, uh, and you'll be fine. And you just like do it, have a better average performance. You'll like won't lose to bad players because like, you know, you just have a really strong deck, and like if they mess up at certain points, you can punish them as opposed to playing something really convoluted. Um, but on the other hand, 
uh, if you do it right, then it can be really good. Um, and everyone copies Japan a lot too much. So Japan doesn't always like have that kind of crazy things because the best of one. Mm -hmm. um, so like sometimes if they miss something, then no one goes looking. Um, that so, is true. I feel yeah. very called out in that one, but also I can confirm that is very much like look at Japanese results and kind of go from there. Yeah, definitely. Um, so I think there's this stuff and Obsidian Flames, the big one to be looking at is Pidgeot. So you think Pidgeot is the card from the set? Yeah, I think so. Let's go. Two like, episodes in a row where the guest is like, Pidgeot is the best thing ever. <laughs> like, I don't think it's insane. So I don't think it's like immediately like the most broken card ever. But it's a big enabler for a lot of things because like you don't. Okay. So what's the problem that like uh, high high um combo decks have at the moment like i would be iono or judge or etc right the hand disruption not being able to pull off the combos yeah and like so either the hand disruption or more so like sableye because your engines are like so vulnerable oh okay yeah, yeah. So if like you have sableye. squishies yeah yeah because like all the good engines are like curlier like if you want to be able to do anything that you want it's like you need a strong engine that just loses to sableye yeah but pidgeot is actually really good against lost zone because it's got like a, a billion health. Yeah, especially um, we've been so seeing a lot cut the Raikou from the Lost Zone deck. It's also like, oh, you can't boss me anymore, right? Mm. <laughs> yeah, I think like, I think that's pretty cool. Um, the Pidgeot's really, really good. Like, there's just no way that card won't continue to see play through its its longevity. Um, it's just got it's just got so much health. Like, it just you know, and you get exactly what you need whenever you want it. It's pretty good. Um, does give up two prizes, but it just means you have to build your deck a little bit better if you want to use it. Um, it incentivizes candy. Um, it's a pivot, which is actually really insane as well. It is so good, actually. Uh, <laughs> the pivot's really good. Um, but yeah, I think that's like probably the biggest card in the set. I also think that Zard is very good. Mm -hmm. So are you team... You are team Charizard. Unlike, again, the Twitter discourse has been... a. Uh... Pretty mixed between it's broken and it's unplayable trash. I think that the card is good. I like saying the card is good, not the deck is good. Mm -hmm. um, because the card is good. Like Anyone who's read the numbers on it is just like, it's good. Sets itself it up, really does a bunch of damage. Seems pretty good. All you need to do is candy into it, then you're done. <laughs> I mean, that's, that's true, that's though, right? Yeah. yeah. yeah like, it, it's like Arceus, where you're like, oh, I don't need a hand anymore. Like I don't care what's I don't have to play any cards. I'm good to go. Just attack, attack, attack. Yeah. I mean, sometimes setting up the next one can be a little bit harder, but like by and large, it does what a stage two at the moment needs to be able to do, which is like just set itself up, plug mm -hmm. and play. Yeah. Um, it's got a ton of HP, but the problem is like it's often built to like not leverage the HP. Like it needs to be built with the HP like in mind for why the card's good. So like Lost Stone Charizard is just like, no offense to anyone who likes Lost Stone Charizard. But it's just the stupidest thing I've ever seen. <laughs> I mean, you're not wrong. It definitely doesn't do the thing the same way that you, straight charge does. does. Yeah, I mean, like, you have 330 health on your Zard, but then you just give them four extra prizes for free on the bench. Or like, five sometimes. Yeah. I mean, like, you're just giving them all this free stuff. Like, it doesn't make sense. You need to be leveraging the HP um, to actually use the card effectively. Um, God of our matchup is not what you'd think it would be. Um... Because like they can just run through you with like reversal baby guardy, but you can definitely like do things to fix that if you have like a good one prize attacker or something. Yeah, shout out to collapse stadium away the guardy ex. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, if you play Charizard on ladder and your guardy opponent doesn't do that at all during the game and you win by gusting every turn, uh, you need to find a new guardy opponent because, like you said, it's unfortunately not. Or fortunately, I don't know which side you want to be on on this, but uh, mm. it is not super Charizard favorite at all, like people were saying in the beginning. No, it's like even at best, at best, yeah, it's like slightly unfavored, I'd say, depending on what you play in the Zard deck. Yeah. Like you have to tech for Gardevoir if you want to beat it. You have to be teching. Um, Single prize yeah, is a so, good I mean, yeah, sure is. But Zard comes in and in theory, should change a few things, but in practice, won't immediately until it starts seeing success. Like Mew won't die off until Zard starts to like dominate. Um, Ooh, say that one louder for the people in the back. 
<laughs> Mew will not die. And I've <laughs> made the mistake of thinking that it has before, and I've been punished. But are you part of the see. reason why day two of worlds was dominated by Mew? Um, yeah, I mean, I lost to one of them, so yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you hate to see it. Don't you just hate to see it? So you mentioned Sableye in there. And you've kind of been like, uh, eh, Pidgeot's cool. Not really, maybe a deck right now. We'll see. Uh, Charizard's cool. Who knows what the deck is? So it seems like then you're heading in the same direction as everyone else, which is mm. Lost Zone Giratina is the deck. It's got Sableye. It's got Star Requiem. It's got Comfy. What more? Path? Woo. What more do you want out of a deck? <laughs> you were the Lost Zone Giratina believer. You made everyone play cross switchers in their Lost Zone Giratina list for two weeks straight until they all cut them at the same time. <laughs> Tell us why Lost Zone Giratina is winning Pittsburgh Regionals. Okay, well, I don't know if it will. <laughs> yeah, a um, couple of things, lots to cover on that that uh, <laughs> sentence you just said. A couple of things. First off, I'm not sure if uh, Zard like or Pidgeot or whatever is a good deck yet. Mm -hmm. Um, and if I was sure about it, you, uh, you better believe I will not be putting out a list until I play it at a regional <laughs> because of the way, now the way the prize money works, I used to be like, you know what? Like sometimes I'll just post lists because it's good. Like get people thinking, like mm -hmm. see what they, they can see what I'm up to. But now <laughs> like, you can, like, this is crazy. You know? Unless I'm in like a, like coaching people specifically and I want them to do well, like, no, like, I'm not putting stuff on Twitter, man. Like, we're, we're good. <laughs> Maybe sometimes on stream, but yeah. So, Tina for Pittsburgh. Um, there's a few things to talk about on that, too. So, I mentioned to you just before we started that I had some opinions on Tina. Mm -hmm. And it's that I think that the deck, still, I still believe this, is um, the deck is probably the BDIF with Cross Switcher in it. So, okay? they got to add their Cross Switchers back but, in? But, hold on, <laughs> let me give you a sec. It makes the deck so difficult to play perfectly, and the deck is only good if you play it perfectly. Mm -hmm. And that was the mistake that I made. I shouldn't have played it for Worlds, because one, I had the, the meta read wrong. But also, it's not better enough than every other deck, even if you do play it perfectly. And so, like, suddenly you just, you just put so much difficulty on yourself to be playing it, that, like, eventually you're just going to mess up at one point, and now you're just playing a worse deck. And it's just so much hard work. Um, Whereas Guardi, you can outplay your opponent, you can play really well, you can snowball leads, like, you you can't just, like, randomly lose, like, Iono, um, and, like, it's just a generally better deck. But everyone's cut Cross Switcher because, I mean, they probably couldn't use it super, like, well in the first place, mm -hmm. but Path is good, and, like, everyone's just gone down the Path route for Tina now. Like, they're just like, I'm going to put it down, and if it sticks, it sticks. Um, See what happens. It doesn't, it doesn't, but, yeah, so... I don't know. I think it's a good deck. I think it's very difficult to beat cleanly, mm -hmm. but at the same time, I don't think it's like some insane behemoth. Um, and I also think that like Mew is pretty good into it. So um, I want to ask your opinion on the path idea. And this is something where I don't care about Pittsburgh or Barcelona or et cetera, because my first events in 151 format, yeah. but people are playing path. We've seen up to four path, three path. I think Pram played two and that's usually the minimum, right? Hmm. is there a world where you like hard read and say all right the popular decks are going to be you know loss on tina where you don't care about path like it's irrelevant you just have four dead cards in your deck at that point you got mahone's maridon seems to be taking off which <laughs> i'm a big fan of as someone who is realizing exactly what you said why play a deck perfectly to do a little better when i can just play a deck that i know i'm going to play well <laughs> That requires very little brain. Yeah. yeah. Uh, four path in that deck, right? Pretty dead card, unless you go first and you path them turn one and they can't tandem unit out, right? And then you also have decks like Mew that largely don't care about path because they have 75 vacuums and multiple counter stadiums, right? And then Arceus, mm. which is also like, all right, you are going to path them eventually, but you already beat Arceus. Is there a world where you're like, maybe I cut the paths because a lot of the most popular decks either don't care they play their own path or i already beat them anyway like do you think it's a world where you just cut the path maybe i like the two i like mm -hmm. playing the two it's actually like kind of the best stadium in tina because okay. you want something to bump stadiums mm -hmm. and like you don't really care that much about greninja 
And so if they put down, I don't know, Lost City, you want to be able to just bump it with Path. It also forces, like, Gardevoir and, like, other decks to play really weirdly because they don't want to get rid of their stadiums. Mm -hmm. So, like, Gardevoir can't just slam down Collapse to like, kill something for, like, no cost because, like, you could just Path them. Mm -hmm. um, or, like, they can't maybe play their Temple and turn off your Jet because then you can just Path them. Or Mew can't just, like, drop Lost City or Vacuum and stuff like that. Um, all the time. So, and, like, if you want to, like, beat Mew with, like, Tomb, for example, like, if you want to do that, which I think Drapion's better, but, like, if you want to play Tomb to beat them, then you actually need to be, like, you use Tomb kind of to burn the Forest Seal Stone from them, mm -hmm. and then you path them. Like, it's not, like, one's not really enough. Um... So I don't mind, like, not playing a heavy count because I don't think it's a good win con into Gardevoir. I think the path, like, is a, a reliable one. But, mm -hmm. yeah, like, I don't think that's, like, the cool strategy of the deck. Okay. One more question, specifically on Tina versus Guardi. This is purely selfish from my own. I test that matchup a fair amount for NAIC before going to Arc Tina because, uh, again, why think when I can just <laughs> see what happens? Nah. Yeah. And I had DM Mike Fouché, who had played it at Worlds 2, went through Day 1, Day 2, shot a Trash Lounge podcast, go listen to them also. But I was like, okay, I cannot figure out how to make this a good matchup for Lost Zone Giratina. Hmm. And he was pretty much like, yeah, if you get the turn two candy Guardi from either way, it seems like Guardi is winning that matchup. Do you have any tips from the Lost Zone Tina side of like, how do you win that matchup if they get the turn two candy guardy are you also kind of like yeah it's really rough from there and you have to kind of play out of your mind to maybe pull it off um i mean you have to play out of your mind in that matchup all the time like mm -hmm. you need to like check all six of your prize cards you need to memorize the order of your deck at every point with iono like you need to know the contents like in between each things you need to know like what you've lost own like it is a headache um, and the Guardi player doesn't actually have to play it as well as you do. Yeah. Um, like, it feels really difficult from both sides. But the secret is Cross Switcher. <laughs> like, the matchup... I'm serious, man. Like, I'm, like... <laughs> it's the only way you can rely... It's the only way you can actually have an even to favorable matchup against it. Because what happens is you... Like, you're going to put your Giratina down, and it has to take two prizes. It has to. Yeah. Or else you lose. True. Right? And the only and like you're getting Iona and stuff like you're not gonna you're not gonna be able to boss their guardy more than half the time mm -hmm. and actually like requiem it quick enough right because you can usually actually kind of do it on like turn three because what they'll do is if they know like how to play it super well they'll probably like crest your Giratina yep right they'll lower the HP so they knock it out cleanly and not get destroyed by Sableye and so then they put you on a one turn clock to find boss KO right it's not many turns right and there. Then, <laughs> No, and how are you going to get the 10 on to like turn three and boss? You can't do it. True. And you can do it with cross switcher, right? And uh -huh. also, cross switcher lets you put pressure on their curliers with the cram, right? Mm -hmm. Like, you can actually cram their curlier. And then, when, well, when you knock out a curlier, well, they put down a route, so you kill it with Sableye. And now they've lost draw, so they might not be able to boss KO. Or you just threaten to just kill their EX randomly, and they have no other one, right? Like, it's not like it's like an even match. Like I've tested it so much, and it's like with cross switcher, it's like even to very slightly favored. Um, maybe like fifty five, forty five, but it's close. Without it, it's bad. One last Tina thing, because hmm. several thousand people are going to listen to this, and they're going to immediately say, "I have to try cross switcher Giratina." <laughs> what is one piece of advice when it inevitably doesn't work out for them? Okay. Um, I still like Giratina. I still think it's a good deck, I want to say, but I'm maybe switching the way that I'm going to approach uh, like tournaments. I don't know if it's a deck I would like personally play after it's kind of bit me a few times from just, you know, poor medical, but oh, I mean, I, I, I want to cut with it. Could be worse. But <laughs> I think that you just need to not overvalue the cross switches. You also don't actually, you don't necessarily need to play them. But if you're not playing them, you should be playing Poke Gear. Mm hmm. Um, because you need to be upping your consistency if you're losing out in power. I think path is not the way to go. I don't think upping the path is like what's going to fix it for you. Um, but I think the cross switch is, is great. More switch cards in the deck is good. Um, it just makes it harder to play. So if you just like can't get them to work straight away, don't just think they're bad. Like maybe just 
a little bit more time in or go the easy way and play the gears and it's so are there other meta changes you're expecting between worlds and obsidian flames i don't even know if that's a meta change also giratina was hyped at worlds and it's still getting super hyped are there any other meta? are you expecting like it's just kind of going to shift over one to one uh you know people are going to respect Mew or not all that kind of stuff like what are some other things that you're like oh these cards are going to change it or do you really think nothing's going to change okay interesting because we've had no japanese results yet correct they are on their off season right now where they only have the league challenge equivalent which it's apparently very much a joke to them which is valid because league (laughs) challenges are also a joke to us but don't don't take the results too seriously no, we don't. We don't have much. Also, they have slightly different format to us. They have one five one, and we don't immediately. Yeah, which remember um, everyone, Mew EX is a very, 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 very good card. <laughs> so that changes things a fair amount. There are a lot of very, very good cards in that set. Also that true. Have not been talking about. But um, yo, can we talk about Tool Drop think- Electrode? Is that where we're going with this? <laughs> no, no. Come on, come on. It's worth a shot. Serious. <laughs> Serious. Um, no, I think that I think that. There will be probably decks that pop up that aren't on the radar right now. There will be new, like probably new decks, and maybe there won't be tier one, or maybe there won't be like, but they'll pop up at tournaments and they'll do well, or there'll be a new way to play Zard or something. And like, uh, like it's just common. Like we just don't have optimized decks. Like, I mean, I, I, I hate always using this as the example, but like, Unified Minds in 2019 came out, <laughs> came out like over a month before Worlds, and no one was playing Mewtwo. And then it won worlds. Like it just it happens more than you think, even in the information era. Like look at Guardi. Like no one played Guardi. Like no one played Guardi. Like taught at EUIC. Yeah, that's another good example. No one played Rapid Strike Urshifu um, when Robin won with it at Liverpool. Like like that. Um, no one played Archbeadra. Archbeadra wasn't a deck until it was suddenly. <laughs> like somehow, it happens way more than you'd think, uh, rather than just out of Japan. The one I always think of is the Cosmic Eclipse, where we had Tina Chomp come out of nowhere, mm. a card that was complete unplayable bulk. No one cared about this thing. And then suddenly Justin, Bu- well, actually, that's not true. It did well in an SPE, like a top eight or something. And then Justin Bakari took it. And I think with Rahul and all them and won a regional with it. And suddenly this unplayable bulk card was now the S tier deck and arguably the BDIF in that format. Yeah, like, I mean, what happened there was that Gustavo Wada got top eight at LAIC with it, and that's how it started. Okay, and then and then no one really talked about it for a while, and then my friend that I tested with was like, "Dude, this deck's broken," and so then he gave it to me, mm-hmm. and I was like, "Yeah, this deck's broken." And so I played it at a regional that weekend. I'd never played it before, and I got top eight. And then he gave it to, I think Rahul or, or Justin, who yeah, who gave it to Justin, and then they won the regional with it. Okay, so I missed um, some of the lore in there. Yeah, it's it's good lore. You may as well drop it when you can. But yeah, like that's a good example. Like this stuff just happens all the time, especially now where because we have so much information, sometimes people can actually, like I said earlier, not actually look. So then smart player while I have you a card like I'm going to say the card, but I'm going to say it after I explain why you talk about it. So you don't roll your eyes immediately. So you evaluate a card and you're like, all right, this is good about it. This is good about it. Like this is very clearly, you know, good ability. It's got high HP. The basics are good. And you're like, okay, mm-hmm. this is playable. At what point are you like, I can keep working with this versus, okay, there's potential here, but I can't crack this nut. And the card specifically I'm talking about is of course, Glamora EX. Mm. But it's a card where the ability is too good to ignore that something could come of it. Right. So at what point do you like throw a bunch of ideas at the wall? And then when do you kind of quit with that? Okay. So the card can be good, but like you got to have a reason why you're playing it. Mm -hmm. Right. So like, why am I playing Glamora? Okay. Well, it like disrupts my opponent's bench. Okay. Well, what decks in the meta are vulnerable to that? Okay. Well, it's kind of only Gardevoir that really cares about it, for example. Right. Yeah. So then like, well, that doesn't seem super worth to only play it for that when it doesn't maybe like beat that all entirely mm-hmm. so but if you think man like this is really good and i know that in the meta at the moment this is like really advantageous so i have a reason to be playing this over something else but sometimes like you might just have a deck that like a, a different archetype just does the same thing better gotcha um, and it'd be like like playing arc umbreon now like why would i play arc umbreon if i can just play zard for example 
Mm-hmm. Which is maybe not a perfect example, but like that's the rough parallel. Um, you have to have a reason for why you're playing a card beyond just like trying to make it work. Um, because every card in theory should like fill its own little slot for like mm-hmm. why you're playing it. Uh, and then, then, yeah, do that. And then one last while I'm still here and have you. So I mentioned earlier, I'm currently in my Maridon era where mm. <laughs> this is the deck that is speaking to me. Okay. Is that the deck that is the ultimate? I don't really want to think. I'm just going to punch you in the face. Or should those of us who are believing in Maridon go back to Arceus? Like, where do you think a deck like that actually sits after having an okay finish at the World Championships? Hmm. Okay. I think that those type of decks should be played exclusively as a meta call. Mm hmm. I think that you should only be playing it if you think that you have the jump and that, man, this is poised so well to go in on the weekend. Sounds good to me. But if it's even A, slightly respected, or B, like not just like an outright call, there is no reason to play a deck with such low low skill expression if you're putting time into the game. Mm -hmm. If you're putting time and effort in, I know I just said that like Lost Sontina is like the opposite end of the spectrum, but like for, for good reason, because I don't want like to... You want to play like a deck perfectly no matter what one you play. Mm-hmm. But it's it's because Lost Zone decks are an exception on that regard because like you can't just learn it. Like you can't just learn all the lines and then when you play it, you know how to play it, right? Like you just get given super hard choices all the time. It's yes. what makes it hard. But there is not a massive amount of reason to play a deck with low skill expression unless it is a really, really good meta call. Mm-hmm. Um, and then you can just like cruise in. And the skill you've used is actually making the meta call. But Otherwise, you're just like better off going to the pokies. Okay. Um, the slot machines. Okay. <laughs> Do you have any other last second thoughts on Obsidian Flames, the format, etc., while you have a captive audience? Sure. Um, like I said, I think Pidgeot's pretty good. I think it's underused. Um, I think that the meta early was really weird because people over respected Zard, but now it's like overcompensated the other way. Um, so I think like. I mean, this is my general thing, like, try and um, don't worry too much about the meta, pick a deck, play it, play it well, um, and then, but also, like, I don't know, maybe try try something new. You never know if you'll find something that no one else has, and go from there. And also, for the love of God, everyone needs to respect Mew. <laughs> so, everyone needs to respect it, man. It's just got to... It's got to, actually this is this is a fun this is slightly unrelated but it just Mew just reminded me. Um, this is a fun fact. Um, I lost my win and end at Fresno Regionals mm-hmm. to Mew. I was playing Gardevoir against Mew, and I lost my win. win uh, I lost my win and end to someone who needed to tie for their invite, um, and I lost to Vance Kelly. <laughs> um, and so he won the Mew versus Gardevoir matchup against me to get his invite. And then he went and won it in the finals to win worlds. <laughs> so Vance owes you for throwing so hard in the Guardi versus Mew matchup. A L- little, <laughs> little bit of credit for that. No, 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 no. He doesn't owe me anything. He beat my ass. But <laughs> um, no, we gotta, we gotta start respecting Mew, man. They can't keep getting away with it. It's amazing. They literally always do. Like outside of the yeah. occasional North American regional, they always do. <laughs> i don't know have you so, read have you read yeah. fusion strike system it's like really good it's pretty good that thing's gonna be good until it rotates yeah does it rotate yeah it, ro- it rotates next next rotation it does yeah i'm pretty sure battle vip pass does too which is oh i cannot wait for that it's gonna make things fun so good um yeah actually like but the night before worlds i was like should i play a fourth nest ball or a spirit tomb i was like I'm gonna I'm gonna go fourth nest ball. It's feel I'm feeling it. Consistency is king. And then I rock up and like Azul and everyone's on Mew and I was like, oh <laughs> Yeah, it was not a tournament to disrespect Mew, like no, the amount of good not. players <laughs> playing Mew is uh very high. Yeah. It was crazy, yeah. Good time. So I think Mew's good at the moment. I think everyone needs to respect it. I think Guardi's good. I think Tina's good but overhyped, but also overhated. Um I think Zard is under optimized uh, i think the chen pao is good if zard gets good uh and i think that arceus is arceus <laughs> is arceus amoeba tier like Arcta- arctana nah it's all right okay 
I got some friends who haven't played for ages, and I can just give them Arctana, and they're like, let's go! <laughs> um, and they do, like, okay, so... Yeah, now we're talking. Yeah. Henry, if people like your takes, uh, do you have anywhere they can find you, any coaching you offer, anything like that, any shout-outs you have? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so, like I mentioned earlier, I'm just doing a whole lot of Pokemon at the moment, so you can follow me on Twitter, at Benry Brand. If you want to, I don't know, work on your game together, I do do coaching. Um, you can find the link in my Twitter. Uh, and I'm actually, you're going to, you're going to make fun of me so hard for this. Probably. I'm going to stream, um, once a week. Uh, you can go, you can go find me on a <laughs> Benry underscore TCG. No, I swear, I swear I'm going to do it this time, Kevin. I swear I'm going to do it. I feel like you've said that every single time you've been on. <laughs> <laughs> it's a bit at this point. Um, but yeah, and then actually I'm working on some cool things behind the scenes. Um, so probably not like immediately, but I don't know. Keep your eye out for the next month or two. All right. Myself, you can find me on Twitch, Twitter, and YouTube at mellow underscore Magikarp. Uh, be sure to rate and review the show, especially if you're on iTunes or Apple Podcasts, because I recently checked because I never check there because I don't use it. And uh, y'all are slacking. Spotify, Spotify users, you've been doing a good job leaving reviews. Apple users, y'all are slacking, and that's fine, except it's not fine because that pushes us up the charts. So it'd be greatly appreciated. This has been another episode of the Lake of Rage podcast. We'll catch you all next week.